slides in presentation mode. Okay, cool. So um, I've been faculty here at CU Boulder for the last five years. And um, before that, I, I was a postdoc with the Critical Zone Observatory and then went on to work with the National Ecological Observatory Network as a staff scientist. And I came to, um, kind of on the front end of the Critical Zone Network starting up as a postdoc because as a graduate student, I felt like I was kind of doing a lot of work on my own. And I was really interested in finding um, an intellectual community and a group of people that were coming together to take a systems approach to thinking about the way the world works. And I found that in the Critical Zone group. So I did a bunch of studies in uh, the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory, which Holly Barnard talked a little bit about um, earlier today. Suzanne Anderson was the lead PI there. And um, it was sort of your, it's kind of your typical mountain CZO site. And so there I learned to explore um, kind of how you integrate hydrology and biogeochemistry, which is my own uh, field and orientation with an understanding of the deep subsurface. And suddenly I got this perspective where I got to think about systems not only just kind of the very, very skin of the Earth's surface, you know, and, and as ecosystem biogeochemists, we kind of dig down into that soil to about 10 centimeters and then often call it quits. But this critical zone group was really thinking much deeper than that and in a very integrated way. And that perspective was really interesting to me as I was asking questions in this system about the fate of nitrogen, a nutrient, and where it ends up in ecosystems, during snowmelt and rainfall, and what changes to the amount of nitrogen coming into forested ecosystems um, mean in terms of their consequences for ecosystems and how they may change in the future. And so my work brought us some insights into kind of the metabolism of these mid-elevation montane systems where our Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory is located. And I did work kind of integrating across biogeochemistry and hydrology that then, because it's a critical zone observatory, brought in others to look at similar questions from different perspectives. And in fact, a master's student of Comanese came in and did geophysics a couple of years later to look at fractures in the same system where I had been working and to kind of discern hydrological flow pads and came to the very same conclusions that I had independently. And to me, that highlighted some of the strength of critical zone scientists coming together with their own sort of disciplinary orientations, but then putting all the pieces together to, to get an integrated picture of the way things work. And so I have carried that with me since, but then pushed myself to take it into the cropland systems where we work today in California in what, in what some might call a societally relevant um, system. We're working on the ground with farmers every day. Um, we also work with state officials and the work that we're doing is related to looking at high loads of sulfur in agricultural systems and what the consequences of large amounts of reactive sulfur are for biogeochemical processes, for mobilization of heavy metals, um, and other sort of ecological impacts. And so I want to introduce that for you a little bit first. So we're motivated to look at sulfur largely because of work that was done on acid rain in the 1970s and 80s. And most people are quite familiar with the environmental uh, story of acid rain, which is that fossil fuel emissions of sulfur and nitrogen oxides were deposited, um, coming from industrial areas, were deposited on remote forests, primarily in the northeastern US and Europe. And we saw whole um, forest stand deaths. We saw acidification of soils and surface waters. We saw loss of base cations um, from soils. We saw a total change to the critical zone, if you will. And the scientists working on that were really effective at connecting those ecological outcomes to um, policy actions. And so we got the Clean Air Act and amendments and that regulated those fossil fuel emissions, which over time of decades has driven down atmospheric deposition of sulfur. We just did a recent analysis of this 
um, showing how through the National Atmospheric Deposition Program and CASNET, the Dry Deposition Program, that we can see the changes in that deposition going from 1989 to 2017. And you can see that now, as a result of the Clean Air Act and amendments, we're basically back near pre-industrial background. So we went from highs of sulfur deposition in the 20s of kilograms per hectare per year down to around two or less. And so this has been considered an environmental success story. And in fact, you see that come through if you look at the surface water record as well. And so this is from um, a stream, stream flow record in the northeastern US where you can see sulfate fluxes in the orange coming down and they're basically following that trend in um, atmospheric sulfur deposition. So it's basically like the sulfur story is over with sort of an end to acid rain, at least in the United States. But in fact, it is not. And this is what we're working on today. So as atmospheric deposition has gone down as a result of emissions regulation, we've actually seen a big uptick in the use of agricultural sulfur products for a whole number of reasons. And so you can see piles of that's elemental sulfur there that's mined, so an impact to the critical zone. And um, it's used as a pesticide, as a fungicide, and in places that were receiving free deposition of sulfur as a fertilizer um, that they just kind of got, and now that stopped, farmers are now having to add sulfur fertilizers to their crops. And this is happening across really broad areas. So for example, corn in the Midwestern US, they didn't used to have to add sulfur because they were getting it from fossil fuel emissions, and now they're adding targeted loads as fertilizer to basically meet the nutritional demands of crops. I mentioned that it's also used as a pesticide and fungicide, and in fact, it is one of the oldest pesticides and fungicides. Um, the Egyptians used it in their crops, and there's a lot of inertia around that use. Um, and we, in my group, got really interested in asking in these places like Midwestern corn or grapes in the state of California or sugarcane in Florida, are we going to see the same kind of effects on the critical zone and on ecosystems that we saw as a result of acid rain deposition as we're having this kind of dramatic increase in agricultural sulfur use. So that's sort of our orientation on this problem. I want to talk about one of the biggest consequences that motivates us, and this gets the attention of the regulators that we work with in the state of California. which is mercury. So mercury is everywhere. I often describe this as the glitter of the element world. You know when you use glitter and you find it years later in, the car in your carpet or your hair or wherever, mercury is the same. It gets transmitted in nanoparticles and it's the, we, we basically take it out of the earth through, through mining, so it's present geologically. We also have it in uh, fossil fuel emissions, and then we see it in fog, we see it in soils and sediments, we even find it on remote mountaintops. So basically, mercury goes everywhere, and it can interact with um, sulfur in primarily wetland systems, and bioaccumulate and biomagnify up the food chain. So in wetland systems, you have sulfate-reducing bacteria, they release an enzyme that then stimulates the methylation of mercury, and that's when it enters the food system and can impact the health of, of people and animals. And the impact is um, a result of mercury act, methyl mercury acting as a neurotoxin. So it has pretty dire effects. There, we do our research in um, the Napa Valley, California, where wine grapes are grown as a monoculture over a vast area of Northern California, and sulfur is used in huge amounts. Um, and down gradient 
of all of this vineyard agriculture. There are the baylands that are just north of the city of San Francisco. And in fact, high rates of methylmercury production have been observed there, but have not been connected to agriculture. So we're exploring that. And in fact, many of the environmental regulators know about these high rates of mercury methylation and they just sort of close their eyes and ears and kind of pretend that it's not happening. Meanwhile, people are fishing in these areas and there are there's a whole wildlife biodiversity that people are interested in protecting. So it's a big issue. So we've basically gone to a place where um, we can study that sulfur use in agriculture kind of in isolation because the landscape looks like this. You look out and it's a blanket of vineyards across vast space. And the reason that they're using elemental sulfur in large quantities is to control um, powdery mildew disease, which is very threatening to grapes. And um, it also completely destroys a crop. So it represents a huge economic loss if it takes hold. So growers use it um, uh, preventatively and often at very, very high rates. So I mentioned before that the peak sulfur deposition load during acid rain was in the 20s of kilograms per hectare per year. In agriculture and in grapes, they use about 150 kilograms of sulfur per hectare per year. So when we're thinking about what the, the consequences might be over a vast space, you can see how that concentrated use may have an effect. So that's where we're going with this research. Now, of course, this is a place where there are people and people who have a cultural history of farming of particular ways and who know their land the best and the management practices that are, that are the best for their, um, for their crop. And there is a certain perspective around using sulfur in agriculture. And so when I first went to this region of Northern California to do this work and started talking about maybe we should look at what the environmental consequences of sulfur are, the response that I got from farmers was sulfur is inert in the environment. And that seemed like you are not going to be able to do any research here because we're not interested in listening. And that obviously was not the case. It did get through, but it took some time because I had to listen to what they wanted to know about, which was water. And so water is, is very scarce. They have to account for every drop because they grow grapes during the dry growing season and have to capture all of their water in the preceding wet season in surface reservoirs or pump groundwater. And so every drop there counts and growers are very vigilant about that. And they're very curious about say the irrigation efficiency that they have and they irrigate by using drip lines. And so they're working pretty efficiently, but there is a relationship between that water and the structure of the soil, as you've heard in a few of the talks today already. And so that was where I sort of came in initially to provide some information. But before that, I want to talk about this whole integrated picture that we're working in of this critical zone in the area. So back to our comfortable picture of the critical zone that you've seen a few times today, which is in the typical critical zone in a forested system. You look at that picture and you think, man, I could take a wonderful nap in that meadow. Like it is a beautiful critical zone. And then you look at the critical zone where I'm working which is like the total human dominated critical zone. So let's break this down a little bit. The, the farmers are completely controlling the water regime and where that water gets routed in the subsurface, often using subsurface pipes to route it off site so that they don't have um, huge gullying and erosion issues on hillsides. And um, they also use tile drains that then go to outlets where they've got canals and those canals shunt that water quickly out to the stream network. And so they're kind of short circuiting uh, that water balance. Um, they're also adding large amounts of sulfur. So that's a big biogeochemical manipulation of the critical zone. They're growing a monoculture across that space. And of course, the people part, they're making a lot of decisions. So my argument here is that it doesn't look like what sort of we thought of as the critical zone when the critical zone observatories kind of came about, but the principles of integrating across these disciplines and considering the whole system really apply here. And the first way that I want to show you is how we won the growers over with our initial work 
using the chemistry and their biogeochemical manipulation of sulfur inputs to actually inform how much water they were losing. And um, my little diagram of that looks something like this. So they're putting on irrigation water. Presumably there is some water stored in the surface. And then I was interested in being able to differentiate flow paths of the irrigation water coming in and going through a macropore network of the, of the stored water that was there in the soil matrix in the micropores, and then using the chemical and isotopic signature of that water to actually calculate the fraction that was lost during every irrigation event, which could then lead to a discussion about modifying irrigation and modifying approaches to water use that could conserve money and resources. And so Jenny Druhan kind of nicely illustrated the um, utility of using stable isotopes as to give you insight about both hydrology and biogeochemical process. And so that's kind of the thread that I'm going to give you now in the work that um, we've done and are doing. But first, a little primer for the uninitiated isotopists in the group. Um, you need to know about sulfur stable isotope biogeochemistry. So when I am talking about stable isotopes, I'm talking about um, sulfur 32 versus sulfur 34, 33, and 36. These all differ, they're all sulfur, this element sulfur, but they differ in their number of neutrons. And we look at the isotopic um, composition of sulfur 34, the second most abundant isotope, relative to sulfur 32. And we have that in a sample relative to a standard composition of some um, substance that we use in the analysis. And the reason we can look at that ratio and that it's meaningful is that different sources of sulfur, say a geologic source versus an atmospheric source or fertilizer, are going to have a different amount of sulfur 34 relative to sulfur 32. So that will affect the values that we get back. The other thing that affects those values are the microbes themselves, because microbes um, basically use that uh, lighter isotope of sulfur-32 preferentially. And so if you have a process like sulfate reduction going on, the remaining sulfate hanging around in your wetland is going to get heavier and heavier with sulfur-34. So then we can gain insight in looking at those data into the processes that might be going on. And we measure these values on a, on a mass spectrometer. So that's the isotopes in a nutshell. And I'm gonna walk you through this as I show you some of the ways that we've used them in this work. Back to water. So we used um, the sulfur isotopes. Basically, I'm giving you the punchline here to get the value that the stable isotopic fingerprint of that irrigation water, which was 5.7 per mil versus the stored water, which was 14.5 per mil. And then we were able to measure the leachate composition in a number of samples across vineyards to basically come up with a distribution of what that, that leachate looked like. And then we were able to create a mass balance model to um, integrate the information from the chemistry, from the stable isotopes, and from the hydrologic fluxes to calculate the proportion of irrigation water that was contained in every leachate sample. And we, will, we were able to use that information, use our little model, to determine that approximately 10% of the water that the growers were applying was lost in cracks and never interacted with the rooting system of the vines. So I took this information back to the growers and, and, and we had a discussion about ways to change their irrigation strategies. And in the end, what many of them opted to do was to actually low their, lower their drip lines to the very surface of the soil so that the water would soak in as opposed to running along the surface and then traveling down a crack. So it was a very simple change to the way that they were delivering water. And it came from the growers themselves in response to studying the system. And that's when I went back to studying all the sulfur and spent time quantifying all the flows in the system. And we put numbers to what biogeochemists love to do most, which is to create a budget of an element. So we calculated the sulfur coming in and inputs 
how much was stored in the soil, how much the plants were taking up, how much was effluxing off the plants after a spray event at, in gaseous forms, and then how much was leaving in streams. And we basically found that pretty much 100% of the sulfur inputs going on, going on in a given dry season was getting transported to streams. So that reactive sulfur was moving off site where it was used to control mildew and then into adjacent ecosystems. Which brings me back to my blue heron eating this vole or shrew, whatever this little animal is. Um, it points to the fact that there may be an impact in the aquatic e ecosystems and that the, there is a chance that these observations of high rates of mercury methylation could be tied to sulfur runoff coming from the vineyards. And so that's where my group is working now. But we had to establish that we could follow the chemical fingerprint of agricultural sulfur at broader scales. Because we're talking about a big basin here that has mixed land use. There are developed areas, there are forested areas and grasslands, and we're trying to track that parcel of sulfur that's moving off the vineyards all the way down to down gradient wetlands that are at the southern end of the agricultural area. So this has been work that my PhD student Anna Hermes, she's a rock star, has been doing um, uh, now in collaboration with our colleague Todd Dawson, who is a um, stable isotope ecologist at UC Berkeley, also a member of our wonderful Critical Zone community. And Anna has been trying to understand what this map of different sulfur sources in the basin looks like isotopically to then guide our further studies, um, looking more deeply into the critical zone function here. So I'm gonna show you some of her data in isotope space. So just to orient you, I've got sulfate concentrations on the x-axis. You can think of as we increase in concentration that that's representing a release of stored sulfur from the soil or the critical zone. Then on the y-axis, we've got the stable isotopic composition of that sulfur that we measure in waters. And you can think of the more negative values as what we refer to as depleted. And so our geologic signals are going to be down there versus the more positive values that are demonstrating microbial processing of sulfur. Remember I mentioned that sulfate reduction has an effect on that stable isotope composition. So the higher those values, the more that sulfate pool has been worked on by microbes. And then I'm going to um, basically break out here in isotope space, different types of water in this area. So irrigation water, the Napa River, which is the, the main stem of the, the stream network, um, runoff from vineyards, soil water, and um, stream water from various locations. So first what I'm gonna show you is that the sulfur that they're applying has been mined, so it has a pretty negative uh, signal in terms of its isotopic value of around um, kind of one to, to zero or even less sometimes. Now that sulfur goes in to the soil and then reacts and the water that we measure in our lysimeters, in our soil water lysimeters, the water that's leached from the fields is highly enriched or positive relative to that sulfur coming on. We think that is due to microbial processing of that sulfur in the soils. So that's our first indication that we really need to look more into that, into the processing in the soil itself. The next bit is the data from vineyard streams and also from forest and grassland streams where agriculture is not present. What you can see is that there is a lot of overlap between the vineyard streams and the water leached from the fields. So something that we might infer or hypothesize to test next is that there's very quick movement of soil water to the stream network from vineyards once the wet season rains start and the stream network becomes activated. So there's rapid movement offsite of water and sulfur from ag fields. I should say here too that it, for the sake of simplicity and the sake of me throwing a lot of isotopes at you at one point in time to a diverse audience, I have removed the actual data points here and I'm merely showing you the space that the data occupy on this figure. 
are forest and grassland streams that are primarily receiving sulfur, low amounts of sulfur from atmospheric deposition and geology are much more negative and distinct from the signal that we see in vineyard streams. So this is really helpful to us in terms of tracking agricultural sulfur at the broader scale through the stream network. And finally, this was kind of a check for us. We went into some uh, tributaries that have mixed land use, so both agriculture and non-agriculture, forest and grassland areas, and they sit right between the vineyard streams and the forest and grassland streams, as we might expect. So what we see here is a really nice separation of these parcels of, of water and these sources of sulfur that are now going to allow us to address in more detail the processing that's going on within the vineyard soils themselves to bring in colleagues to address the timing of water and sulfur transit from fields to the stream and also to look at the basin scale to do some testing to determine if it is agricultural sulfur that is stimulating mercury methylation in the wetlands, which has really important implications for conversations about how to optimize sulfur use with our stakeholders, and also from the management side of um, using the resources and kind of promoting the health of those wetland areas. Basically, the source of that sulfur matters um, if it's coming from agriculture in terms of having those conversations. So this initial isotope map of, of sulfur in the area is pointing us to further critical zone studies that we want to do now and in the years to come. Now I said that part of my motivation here was to bring the tools and the perspective I got from doing research in the critical zone um, community to work with stakeholders on the ground. Um, and so we work directly with farmers. We work with UC California Extension. Um, and we work with um, other researchers who are engaged in looking at ways that farmers get their data to basically promote kind of a bottom up change in how people perceive their sulfur use and thinking about ways to reduce the use and the preventative spraying of sulfur while maintaining their goals with respect to um, achieving the crop that they want to achieve. So that's all part of the optimization piece. So we work with these different organizations and farmers on the ground to basically have these conversations as we're doing the research itself. Um, the other thing that's really nice is that this community is really tapped into using conferences and journals as a way to get information as well. So we can translate the work that we do in a science space into one that is more a practitioner space and where people can take that information and actually inform their decision making with it. Um, so again, our goal is both a bottom up change where farmers are directly involved in the research and hearing the results as they come out and using them to inform day to day decisions. And then in the last year, we've also connected with regulators at Cal EPA who are using our research findings basically to inform their monitoring programs for sulfur and methylmercury in the state of California in agricultural areas, and are also paying attention to it to see if stricter regulation of agricultural sulfur use is going to be necessary down the line. And so we went in one day and basically had a conversation to say, how do we best make our data available to you? How can we ensure that we make this um, translation step kind of to the, to the policy level? We also work with the state water boards to do that as well. Now, part of why I wanted to mention this is to just kind of put out there for some food for thought, because there's been a lot of discussion in recent years in the critical zone community about how to make critical zone science relevant and how to put it in this societally relevant space and what is useful. And one critical zone, senior critical zone scientist said to me once, I think we're successful when there's an article in the New York Times that talks about the critical zone. And I thought, yeah, okay, but like that term, it's, it's so academic. So what I wanted to say here is that the systems approach that I learned to consider through, through working in the critical zone observatories is extremely useful for working in an agricultural setting in a setting where there are a lot of different people involved making decisions and you're trying to translate science into action. 
So yes to the systems approach. And what it also does too is to point out where you've got blind spots, where you haven't paid attention. So maybe that's in considering the deep um, subsurface in our systems. We haven't done that yet. Do we need to do that? That's something to consider, but my critical zone brain kind of forces me to ask myself that question when I'm looking at the, the data sets that we're, we're bringing together. The other thing that's great is that the critical zone science community really encourages collaboration and participation, and I believe gives you automatic access to people who are willing to work on different aspects of a problem. And that is really positive for critical zone science. Where I don't think it works quite yet is that I haven't found myself using the critical zone term when I'm having conversations with farmers, when I'm talking with regulators, when I'm talking with other stakeholders. So sort of the language and branding around critical zone science um, hasn't worked as a broad communication tool to me. For me, even though my research group is, is basically doing it all the time. And I'd be very interested in hearing from other investigators out there who are working in these types of settings and whether or not you have used critical zone science in, in dialogue with um, other groups. I think this is really important in the context of how we make critical zone science societally relevant and what we consider to be success for sort of radiating this type of science out into the decisions that we make in many different arenas um, and in our, our communications about how we do and why we do the work that we do. So with that, I'm going to cut it here and take any questions that you have and say thanks. And I will also say to the students and postdocs out there, I'm always willing to connect and talk about um, being part of the critical zone community or doing this kind of integrated research. So don't um, hesitate to reach out to me if you'd like to connect um, after this uh, cyber conference. Thanks.